Good evening. I hope wherever you may be tonight in this coronavirus moment that you are each healthy, safe, and able to practice your trade. I hope that you are watching out for any neighbors who may be struggling. Our daily lives today face serious challenges that we did not face even last September when you nominated me as your candidate for the President of the United States. In October and November, I drove a loop through 12 states, freely attending the Rehumanized Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana, joining a home meeting in Dallas, speaking at Dort University in Iowa, and meeting several of our state leaders along the way. In December, I was in Colorado and Arizona. In January, I joined thousands of our pro-life peers for March for Life events in Los Angeles, Oakland, and San Francisco. In February, I attended Oregon's annual pro-life conference and met our Solidarity Party leaders in that state. From Portland, I flew to Chicago to participate with about 20 other alternative party presidential candidates in a debate. Then it was back to Portland and up to Seattle, where I met March 7th with our team in Washington State and joined in their planning to get us on the ballot there. By that time, of course, we were beginning to deal with a new reality. The signature gathering that political campaigns traditionally rely upon were no longer possible. Public events were beginning to shut down and we began a state-by-state -state patchwork of quarantines and lockdowns. I got home to California on March 9th and have not been beyond the market and the hardware store any time since, and those trips with a mask. This was not the campaign that we or anyone expected, but it hasn't been necessarily bad. Less travel and more Zoom means less time and expense. I can meet with teams in Nebraska, Utah, and Washington all on the same day and without getting on an airplane. Some states have changed their signature requirements or their procedures for getting on the ballot. Vermont, for example, went from being one of the most difficult states to being one of the easiest. Some states have now allowed electronic signatures. Others have extended deadlines. We won't know until later in the summer a complete list of the states in which we have qualified, but the expectation is that the picture will look much rosier than it appeared in those first discouraging days of March. Another area of encouragement comes as we see individual states getting organized. Because I am interacting with so many different state organizations, I have a privileged perch from which to watch all this activity and is fun to see. For example, North Carolina sets the requirements for ballot access impossibly high, and they don't even bother to report any write-in votes for minor candidates. That looked like a difficult and unrewarding task, but we have a group in North Carolina who said, we'd like to give it a try. They might just make it. But either way, they are going to come out of this election with an organized party structure and the relationships upon which our party can be built over the foreseeable future. Oregon is another state where the bar was set ridiculously high, but our people on the ground are not letting that stop their efforts. In states like that, by the way, one goal needs to be joining with other small parties in efforts to change the rules. Ranked choice voting and lower thresholds for ballot access need to be high priorities. I have not yet mentioned the other major shift in our world during the last couple months, and that is the reaction sparked by the killing of George Floyd. The American Solidarity Party is in a good position now because our platform was already calling for the kinds of reforms that are now gaining more attention. We called for innovations in policing, courts, and corrections, in banking, 
real estate law, and education. Politics is the art of the possible. And this year's events have redefined the possible. We've advocated for universal health care. One impediment to health care reform has been people who liked their employment-based health insurance. They didn't want to lose it. COVID-19 exposed to us all just how fragile that system is, how easy it is for an individual to lose both their job and their insurance just at the moment that it is most needed. COVID-19 also exposed how much my health depends on the health of both my neighbor and even perfect strangers. As recently as the early primaries, one candidate was calling for a universal basic income, getting lots of media attention, but very few votes. Now we have seen the president and both parties in Congress joining together to send out stimulus checks that look a great deal like a UBI. I would like to think that the new willingness to face some problems with an openness to finding solutions will also extend to the issues of climate and environment. That remains to be seen. In all of this, the ideas of solidarity, subsidiarity, and distributism come out looking pretty good. We may be stuck at home more, but there is evidence that more of us are thinking about the difficult situations faced by many of us and wondering how we can rectify those situations. We're all in this together. Subsidiarity has proven to be the most effective way to approach the virus. Early on, no one had good information or any proven solutions. Where we allowed local groups to consider local conditions, we got a double benefit. Lots of approaches got tried so that each local area could compare its results to the successes or failures of its neighbors, and we could begin to identify patterns of workable solutions. And then local people could appear before local governing boards to give feedback. Meanwhile, the federal government could attempt to serve as a clearinghouse for information. Considering distributism, both the epidemic and the violence hurt our economy in ways that could have been prevented. If we had had an economy designed along more distributist ideals and healthy employee unions. While the quarantines pushed many small businesses into failure, the commercial giants saw profits skyrocket. One industry, meatpacking, saw a disproportionate level of virus positives and business closures. How would that have been different if workers had possessed more voice in decision-making and if worker health and safety had been a greater concern in relation to shareholder returns? As recently as January and February, many of our fellow citizens were operating under inertia and a false sense of security. Now the inertia has been broken and the sense of security has been punctured. That can be very scary. But it also means people will be more open to listening to new ideas. As the American Solidarity Party, that is exactly what we have to offer. We don't owe anything to entrenched power interests. What we owe is to our neighbors, our families, and our children's futures. I thank you for the privilege of serving as your point man as we move forward towards these goals. And I urge you to leave this convention with a renewed commitment to our common effort. Thank you.